Why get a vaccine if it doesn't prevent you from getting COVID or spreading it to others and has no long-term studies? First, I'm, I'm uh, going to challenge you where you found your information that it doesn't have an effect on preventing COVID infection because the vaccine does prevent COVID infection. So if you look at this, the studies that were actually done, the vaccines do quite a good job of that. It prevents viral infection in about 95% of people who come into contact with the virus and it makes you less sick. It reduces your chances of getting uh, into hospital and dying from the virus. Now, here's some actual data about how likely you are to actually get the COVID infection once you've been fully vaccinated. In Alberta, we've shown that after a year of giving COVID-19 vaccines, that after two doses, only 0.8% of fully vaccinated individuals got COVID infection, 0.8%. We've also shown here in Alberta that the COVID-19 vaccinations are effective against even the Delta variant with an effectiveness of 89%. This data should put to rest all questions regarding whether the vaccine is effective, even against variants like the Delta variant. So that was the Alberta experience here in Canada. But from an international perspective, here's some data presented by the US CDC that captures data from the United States, UK, Canada, and Qatar. This is another reliable website that you can check out at your own leisure. But you can see, even against the Delta variant, all the mRNA vaccines that we have available against COVID still have significant protection against infection, against symptomatic disease, and against hospitalization. Let me just note that 75 or 79% here is not like getting 75% on a test. Just as an example, the shingles vaccine that we used to have before 2018, that only had a 50% efficacy rate, and still people were asking for it because some protection is better than no protection. And the fact that these vaccines are still almost 80, 90% effective against the Delta variant is fantastic. And now, of course, in the month of November 2021, we have data on the efficacy of the mRNA vaccines in children. And yes, even against the Delta variant, the Pfizer mRNA vaccine has been shown to be over 90% effective at preventing symptomatic disease in children 5 to 11 years old. And in terms of preventing transmission, if the vaccine prevents you from getting the virus in the first place, and we know it does, then you'll, you'll be less likely to transmit it because you won't get it in the first place. So that's just common sense, right? There's, there's other studies that were done after the initial studies that were published about the vaccines. And, and these studies show that even if you're amongst the very few who have had both shots of the vaccine, who still are unlucky enough to be infected with the virus, you have a reduced viral count in your body. So you have less viral particles in your body if you get the vaccine. And because you have a reduced viral count, that also means you shed less of the virus and you're less transmissible. Now, of course, that's all changed with the arrival of the Delta variant in July. You may be aware of some studies that suggest that the viral load inside fully vaccinated patients that have been infected with the Delta variant being the same as the viral load inside infected patients who have not been vaccinated. And of course, the media made that out to be super alarming. But we need to remind ourselves, what exactly is viral load? What does that term mean? It means simply the number of copies of viral RNA that PCR machines have been able to isolate from samples. Now, we know that just simply talking about the number of copies of viral RNA found in a sample doesn't tell us whether the viruses that were in that sample were actually more contagious or not. And it turns out that if you culture the viruses found in patients who have been vaccinated versus cultures of viruses found in patients who have not been vaccinated, and by culture, I mean actually putting the viral specimens found in the samples taken from these patients onto a Petri dish and seeing if they actually infect human cells, the cultures actually found that the viruses taken from patients who have been fully vaccinated were not as infectious as the cultures of viruses found in patients who have not been vaccinated. So even if you don't agree that having a reduced risk of infection will reduce your risk of transmission, which is common sense because if you don't get it, you won't transmit it. Even if you get it after having been fully vaccinated, your risk of transmitting the virus to other people is still less than if you were not vaccinated. So we know there's, there's questions about the risks and benefits of the vaccination, and if you haven't been vaccinated, you should make a calculation in your, in your head about what, whether it's worth it or not. I just want to make it a bit more explicit by showing you this figure. 
Myocarditis is the only known side effect of the mRNA vaccines. And it's a side effect that is that does affect the heart, but it's treatable. People don't die from this generally, if you can get access to good healthcare. You can see the benefit and risk trade-off here. You can see how many people's lives are saved and how many hospitalizations are prevented by getting fully vaccinated versus cases of myocarditis. And this is U.S. data, so they have a lot more patients in their database with which to make a conclusion. This is the link where I got it from. The government of Alberta's website even says that myocarditis from COVID itself is 100 times more frequent than myocarditis from the vaccination. And then, of course, we're always concerned about kids. Does the risk-benefit trade-off change in kids? Per every million people who are fully vaccinated, you have 8,500 COVID cases prevented in girls and over 5,000 cases prevented in boys. We not only have to look at the hospitalizations and ICU admissions and death, but an often ignored result of COVID is long COVID. They look at kids who've had long COVID. This is disability. This is disability preventing them from doing the sports they want to do, from doing school, from being able to keep up with the other kids. This is not good for their development. And 10 to 30% of people who get COVID have long COVID. That's probably about up to 2,000 of the boys and up to 3,000 of the girls can, can get long COVID. So that's, that's something that science doesn't really know much about how to treat. We just support people with their symptoms. We don't really know the root causes of it yet. So that's something that is concerning to me as a doctor. I have patients in my practice who have long COVID. I can't treat them because there are no treatments for it. I fill out disability forms. That's it. And they take time off work and fingers crossed they get better. Anyway, but you can see that we, we do prevent hospitalizations, we do prevent ICU admissions, and we do prevent death. And there might be X number of myocarditis cases out of every million kids. But again, those cases are treatable. And it's about, again, a risk-benefit calculation.